Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Classroom Matters podcast with me, your host, Christy Hool, where we dive into some of the hottest topics in education today. Our guest on this episode is Dr. Stephanie Gregson, who currently serves as the Deputy Executive Director for the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence. Stephanie's focus is on school turnaround, centering on improving teaching and learning, aimed at equitable access, opportunity, and outcomes for students. Stephanie has more than 24 years of experience in public education and started her career as an elementary school teacher, but has also served as an administrator and as a district leader. Dr. Gregson has anchored her decision-making upon the belief that every student deserves the opportunity to thrive in an ideal learning environment. Welcome to the show, Dr. Gregson. So we're so excited that you're here with us. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Okay. So that intro was a lot. (laughs) So I'm going to circle back um, and we're going to kind of chunk that apart because I know I said a lot in there. So I want you to just to kind of start by talking to us about your organization, um, the, the work that you've done in the past as an educator and really what led you to the work that you're currently doing today. Okay, so I'll start with the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence that was created through legislation to be a nimble and flexible arm of our state agencies dedicated to education to support districts that are that need help with advising, assisting on their local control accountability plan goals. Uh, That really is the nexus of the CCE is to support districts in meeting their LCAP goals. However, easy to say, much harder to do. Uh, So as far as my experience is, is you mentioned that I started as a classroom teacher. I started in the 97, 98 school year as a fifth grade teacher. And I had a unique experience as an elementary school teacher. I was able to loop with my students. So I kept my students for three years, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. I did that twice. And it was an amazing experience. And we're, we're talking about collaborative culture. So I wanted to bring that up because I had three years with my students and families to really involve and engage them in the learning environment that was created in our classroom and the environment that was created our sc- at our school site together. And one of the main goals was lifting up the voices of their students and their families within this environment. And I just, it was amazing experience to keep my kids for three years Mm -hmm. to really get to know who they were as individuals, where they wanted to go, meet them where they're at and ensure that they were thriving Mm -hmm. in that way. And then taking that experience to the state level. Uh, So I was with the California Department of Education for five years, and approximately two of those years, I was the chief deputy superintendent of public instruction. So I ran the Department of Education with the state superintendent. That was during 2020 and 2021. Mm -hmm. So quite the experience of how to create collaborative cultures during the pandemic. And there was a lot that we learned from that. And one of the things that we learned was that every student deserves the environment that helps them thrive. And I can go into that later around barriers that exist for student learning. But it just, you know, I wanted to make sure that I, you know, thread the needle from going to the classroom to the state level because I bring that experience from what it meant to create a collaborative culture in the classroom level to the state level in my conversations with Department of Finance, the legislative staff and legislative members, the State Board of Education, and then all of the decision making that we had to do during that time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I'm and I'm really glad that you mentioned that as well. And that we've went back to your classroom experience because I think it's so important um, that you have really seen all sides of the educational environment. You've been in the classroom, you've been in central office, you've now at the you know the state level, and all of these different angles that you get to see and the experience that you have that you can bring to the table to help the teachers that are now currently 
teaching with their own challenges and their own barriers post COVID. So let's, you you know, you've said, and I know that this is the topic of the podcast. So I want to really talk about what we mean when we say a collaborative culture. And because I know that there are many different ways that, that folks that are listening might take that. And I really want to make sure that we're all on the same page. When you talk about a collaborative culture in any educational setting, what, what does that look like um, through the lens of your organization and the work that you do? So authentic collaborative culture for us, when we say that, means that there is a significant focus on student learning. And that focus is around essential questions of what do we want our students to learn? How do we know that they've learned it? What are we going to do if they have? And what are we going to do if they haven't learned them? And those are four simple questions, but they require deep collaborative collaboration with teachers as grade level partners, as school site teams with their principals and with families to really get down to what do we want our students to learn and how do we know that they are, they're successful in that learning. Uh, there's layers in building a collaborative culture. You have the classroom level, you have the school site level, the district level, the county level, and the state level. And each of those layers requires us to think about student learning as the central focus of conversations. And so in order to do that, we have to pay attention to us as adults of how we're showing up in spaces for students. One of the models that we have at the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence or CCE is the intensive assistance model. We are uh, in partnership with five districts in eight schools across the state. And it is, a model that really focuses on student learning and the adult behaviors around student learning. One of the teachers that we work with, she calls it, she goes, I thought we were doing collaboration, but really it was collaboration. <laughs> and it was because they were talking about logistics. They were talking about field trips. They mm-hmm. were talking about, you know, Yard duty, who was on yard duty next? All of those things that weren't focused on student learning. And so this model created that opportunity for them to be coached and really dive into self-reflecting on how they were showing up in the space together as teachers, building a space of transparency, vulnerability, and courage, talking about their data as classroom teachers, talking about their successes, but most importantly, talking about where they need help and where mm-hmm. they need growth. Mm-hmm. That is authentic collaborative collaboration. Mm-hmm. And so I know that there are teachers listening and probably administrators that are saying, yeah, that sounds great. And, and I really want to do that. In my last school district, I did that. And now I'm in a new school district and we're not doing that. And, you know, everyone just teaches and then they shut their doors and and they and they do have, you know, in my conversations with teachers and districts and schools, there are a lot of meetings, but a lot of it is what you're talking about. They're they're doing a lot of housekeeping and they're talking about this, you know, problem with this child or this problem with this resource that they do or don't have. And so how what are some steps that we can take for these folks that are overwhelmed to even just get this process started? Because it can seem so overwhelming to folks, especially educators, when you're saying these things. It is. And, you know, it's common sense, but mm-hmm. it's not common practice. Mm-hmm. And so one of the one of the places that we started with the districts that we work with was getting the commitment from the superintendent and the district administrators to clear away any detractors from the principal and the teachers to being able to focus just on the teaching and learning element at their school site. So if there were competing district priorities, we asked them to clear the path for that as principal to be able to focus on this model, to clear the path for the teachers to be able to focus on this model, and to also provide them the supports and resources that they need to focus Mm -hmm. on this model. And that resource is, is collaboration time, 
some that's already built in, that resource is ensuring that substitutes are available for grade level planning time for their coaching sessions, because this is a job embedded professional learning element. There are coaches that come in to their classroom, to the space in the school site and work with the teachers. But first and foremost, you have to take away the detractors and really ask yourself around, is this making a difference? Is this not? What can we let go of? Mm -hmm. And giving yourself permission to let go of priorities or initiatives that are detracting away from student learning and student results. Is it true that we assume that if we, if we give teachers the collaborative time and we give them their PLC time or their grade level team time, that we actually also have to teach them how to use that time and we have to actually train teachers on how to collaborate? Yes. And the first place to start with is developing that shared understanding of what is their goal? Mm -hmm. What is their vision, their mission together as a school site team? If they don't have that shared common sh mission and vision, then they're starting from different places. Mm -hmm. And they'll, ne you know, it'll be take longer to get the space of being able to be coached and true collaboration time. Mm -hmm. So sh starting with that shared understanding, mm -hmm. creating that space of it's OK to say you need help. It's OK where your students didn't do well on this one part of the exam, but did well on the other. Mm -hmm. Let's dive into the why and help each other. Um, but you have to create the space to do that. Mm -hmm. And they need help. Every school site needs help creating that space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And would you say not only creating it, but giving giving them the resources to help them follow through with it for the long haul? Because is that maybe one of the barriers that you see is that, you know, we as educators often talk about the the drive through PDs that we get, the drive through professional developments where, you know, they'll call everybody together at the beginning of the year and say, oh, we were bringing in, you know, the CCEE to help us <laughs> with this. And then they're like, oh, great. They get jazzed up and then a month goes by and they they really don't hear much about it anymore. So what is that? Would you say that's one of the biggest barriers to some of the, the things that we're asking of educators and even in creating collaborative cultures? And then they just kind of give up. Most definitely. I, you know, part of that is turnover too. Mm -hmm. turnover in leadership, turnover at the school site level, one stop professional learning. We know there's a ton of research out there. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It does not work. And any type of professional learning, and especially with this model, that it needs to be supported at the district level and at the county level so that there is alignment of what it, the language being used, the offerings around professional learning, that they're all centered on building that collaborative culture with teachers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What what do you see with teacher buy-in with this? Because I also know a lot of teachers listening and, and a lot of challenges that you probably face are teacher buy-in. And so so is that a challenge for you? And if not, um, how long does it usually take with this model? that that your organization puts out for them to actually see the results? How long do they need to stick with it? So our model is a three-year project because we wanted to go in deep with each of the school site teams. We just completed our first year. We're in our second year of implementation. We have videos on our website from teachers sharing around their journey for the past year. And one of the common messages that we've heard from the teachers is, this is hard. Mm -hmm. but it's the right work that we need to do. It's hard because we've, we're asking them to look in the mirror constantly. Mm -hmm. There is what you'll find with the teachers that are in this model is there's an absence of blame and excuses, which is really powerful because they're really centered on what are we doing for the students? There's no blaming the students. There's no blaming the families. It's really centered around how are we as a team showing up for our students? It's not my students. It's our students. Mm -hmm. Now, they've said it is really hard work. And at the end of the first year of implementation, they also said that it was the most invigorating work that they've ever done. Uh, teachers spend an enormous amount of hours on a daily basis with the students, with their colleagues, 
you know, lesson planning, learning together, all of those elements. But what this model does is that it focuses their time so that they have more energy. And you, know, one of the teachers shared that, that it's hard work, but I actually, I have more energy because of this. Now, we've also had teachers that felt that this wasn't the work that they wanted to do and they transferred out of the school mm -hmm. sites. Uh, there is that challenge as well. Uh, some adults, and it's not just teachers, adults in the system have a hard time looking in the mirror. Mm -hmm. And that can you know, be a self journey and help them to see that maybe this isn't the way that they want to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what does this look like in practice? So I know that, you know, the theory behind it and the science behind it and the model and is it, is perfect and it sounds great and it sounds like it works. And I know a lot of people are like, yeah, that's I would love for that to be happening. I would love to, to be doing that. But what does that look like in practice when you go into a school or you walk into a, a data team meeting or you walk into a grade level team meeting or uh, a a PLC day or just walk into a building and spend a week in there. What does this model produce and what does that look like? And can you even tell that this school has really got a collaborative culture and this school maybe does not? You can definitely tell. Uh, one of the, the telling factors is that you have a shared language between all of the teachers, between all of the staff at the school site team. They all know what their vision and mission is. They can recite to you, this is our vision, this is our mission, because it's entrenched in them. It lives within them when they are at the school site, when they're with their students. So that's one difference. You can also see goals, uh, goals posted in the classrooms. You'll see that, oh, they have a, a literacy goal, they'll have a mathematics goal, and the students are able to articulate, oh, this is our classroom goal, but for me, this is my personal goal. This is where I want to achieve. So the students are able to articulate where they're at in their learning and where they want to go. And it's a shared language amongst the, the students and the teachers. When you walk into the teacher collaboration space, you see data across the walls for every single student. And every teacher knows where every single student is and what they need to continue moving forward in their learning. That right there is a huge different from, difference from the school sites that are, do not have a collaborative culture because they keep things very close to the vest. Their data is close, their closed doors. Um, in this authentic collaborative culture, doors are wide open and the language is our students, not my students. Mm -hmm. So those are just a few of the differences. What you, what it takes to get there is a lot of coaching. Mm -hmm. First year, they had over 50 days of job embedded coaching for the teachers and for the principal. So a part of that is building that shared vision and mission. A part of that is the teachers diving in to identify what are the essential standards that they want their students to learn and essential standards all the way from TK through sixth grade. We also have a middle school in our project, but it's that cross grade level articulation saying, hey, I need my, my students to know this when they come to me. Can you help me with that? Where are the essential standards that, that align uh, across the grade levels for that? So that is deep work that they do. And then the teachers engage in developing or pinpointing common formative assessments to determine, do our, did our students learn what we taught? Because mm -hmm. uh, that's the nexus is the, the student learning piece. Did they learn what, I what we taught? I had the pleasure of talking to a 30 year veteran teacher, middle school, English teacher, 30 years. And she said that she used to teach what she wanted to teach, the novels. You know, novels. It was all about the novels that I wanted to teach. And with this model, her mindset completely shifted to what do I want my students to learn? And what are the resources I'm going to use to mm -hmm. get them there? Huge shift for that teacher. And she was super excited about it and very willing to share mm -hmm. that that was a shift for her. That was a growth for her. That it's not about the novels that she wanted. It's about what the students needed to learn. Mm -hmm. Do you think that so as you're as you're talking about this and the stories and, and what some teachers, you know, are are 
doing in these collaborative cultures? Because I know that these models exist across the country, you know, in other states, you know, other state organiz- educational organizations are doing similar things to what your organization is doing. And I'm, and I'm sitting here thinking about new teachers, teachers that are just graduating from their teacher program at, from their university, um, their you know higher level education going into a school district. Do you think that this work, that this model needs to actually start sooner? And what are the chances of getting these types of programs in teacher education programs in colleges and universities across the country? Because they could already have a head start um, in, in knowing what to do. Because I think part of it too is thinking of new teachers. Um, and actually, I I thought about this because I was talking with a teacher that was in their teacher program the other day, and we were talking about the standard. And the standard was asking the students to analyze uh, a component of the lesson, but the teacher candidate had really not even been taught what it means for your students to to know what it means to analyze um, text or a a narrative. And so we kind of had to go all the way back, (laughs) but they're getting ready to, you know, walk into a classroom and start teaching. And so what are your, what's your opinion on bringing this model even further down to teacher educational programs? I think it's a necessity. Mm -hmm. I think that that's how we need to model what our, what we expect our teachers to come prepared to do in each of the school schools. Yeah. It, the credentialing programs, it, it vary across our all higher ed and also county programs. They're completely varied. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can speak from my experience in my credential program. My reading foundations class taught me how to teach to an all white gate class. Mm-hmm. I taught in Oak Park in Sacramento, seven different languages in my classroom. I was unprepared coming out of the credential program to meet the needs of my students. I had to go through a lot of professional learning to get there. If I had been offered that in my credential program, I'd be, I would have been farther along as a teacher Mm -hmm. uh, right from the very beginning of my first year. Uh, So it it is an absolute necessity Mm -hmm. that we look to see how we can partner with our credential program Uh, partners and higher ed and at the county offices to get in deep with this model for teachers right from the very start. Yeah. And that it's also aligned with their support as they come out of the credential programs and go into the classroom. Yeah. So your advice would be then if you are in another state, you're a district leader, superintendent, and you're rolling this type of model out, get in touch with your um, universities, colleges, where you're getting a lot of your educators and really try to partner up with some of these programs. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And make um, this the expectation of what you mm-hmm. want your teachers to come prepared with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great advice. Um, so let's talk a little bit about barriers. Cause I know you mentioned that at the beginning and I did want to, I wanted to chat because I know teachers are listening and principals are listening and they're going, yeah, but yeah, but like you said, you know, it's this and it's that, and there's a lot of barriers and there's a lot of challenges. And I know there's a lot of excuses, but teachers have a really, really hard, hard job, much harder than when I started teaching back in the, we won't say when, but (laughs) a really long time ago, let's just say my, my first group of second graders are now in their thirties and getting married. So, you know, it was, (laughs) it was different. You know, I taught Johnny Appleseed for two weeks. I didn't have a thing to do with um, the the standards, but you know, that was different then than, than what we're doing now, but they have so much more work to do with data and meetings and, you know, teaching to the whole child and, you know, SEL and different languages. So what are you seeing are some of the, the biggest challenges and barriers to teachers um, and, and administrators too? I think one of the biggest barriers is expecting the teacher to do everything on their own without support resources. I, you know, the teacher is not the sole person responsible. There is a team that needs to wrap around the student. The team is the family, the teacher, the principal, all of the support providers within the school site, the district. Uh, so I think that's the first one is, is that a basic understanding that it is not the sole responsibility of the teacher, that every single person within the school site, the family and the district has a responsibility to support their students. So that's one. The other is the amount of priorities and initiatives that are happening within a school site, within a district 
is daunting. It's exhausting and overwhelming. And how, as a teacher in the classroom, do you decide, I can't pay attention to that? And what are the ramifications or consequences if they don't pay attention to it? So as principals and district leaders, we have an obligation to clear the path for teachers mm-hmm. to be able to focus on their students in their classroom during the time that they have them. And principals need to have the support from the district administration to say, okay, we have too many priorities initiatives. Let's rethink this and look at coherence. Is there a shared understanding of what's important and what's not across the district and into the school sites and into the classrooms? At the higher level, at the county and the state level, we have a lot of education code and policy that hinder innovation and creativity to meet the needs of our student population that we have now. Like you mentioned, the students that we served back when we started teaching are so very different Mm -hmm. than who we serve now. Just the life that they live, the social media part, uh, that alone is a huge difference. And how are we meeting students where they're at right now Mm -hmm. with 1960s, 1970s education code and policies. So those are some of the main barriers that we're seeing in our work Mm -hmm. that we're trying to disrupt. Yeah, yeah. So what's one piece of advice that you would give to teachers, especially, and I really just kind of want to throw this out to teachers because I know they feel the weight of almost everything when they go home at night and they're, you know, whether they're trying to build that collaborative culture through this type of model, or they just want to try to build this because they know, like you said, it's common sense, but they don't. And they're, you know, there's a lot of teacher burnout. There's a lot of really, really good teachers that are sort of just saying, I I can't do this anymore. Um, It's just, I'm not seeing the growth in my students. I'm not getting the support. Um, I want to stay in it, but I just can't. What, what's some advice that you could give to them to, be able to forge forward with a healthier mindset? So we all have agency and I would advise them to use their voice Mm -hmm. and use their agency. And if they're seeing that their system is not working for them and their students, disrupt it, disrupt the system because the system is designed to do exactly to get the results it's getting. Mm -hmm. And that means that it's not working for every student. And so as a teacher, you have agency, you have control over what happens in your classroom. You have voice to help guide and disrupt the system at your school site and your district level. I advise you to use it. I would also advise you to be aware of how you as the adult are showing up in spaces Mm -hmm. and to paying attention to that. Uh, Our system is made up of adults serving students. Mm -hmm. And adults come with their own experiences and perspectives that shape how we make decisions. And the more aware we are of ourself and how we're showing up and how we're letting our perspective experiences shape those decisions, the more open-minded we can become Mm -hmm. to create change. Yeah. Yeah. That's great advice. Yeah. Disrupt. I love that. (laughs) <laughs> disrupt um, get in but, good trouble <laughs> but in a professional way <laughs> yes <laughs> oh, because I well and I'm sure too as you were saying that I I know there are if if one teacher is listening to this and thinking yeah that's good advice I want to disrupt because I want to see positive changes there's other teachers in that same building in that same district that are feeling the same way So find your voice, do it in a professional, respectful, solution-based manner, right? Um, But yes, I love that advice. I think that's that's amazing. Um, So Dr. Gregson, California Collaborative for Educational Excellence, how do listeners contact you? Where can we find your organization if someone wants to reach out and has a question or just needs more information on this model? So we have our website. It is ccee-ca.org. Uh, We have a page around our intensive assistance model with videos where you can hear from other teachers sharing their journey over the past year. We have about three of those videos up. We also have a podcast where you can hear more in depth from a superintendent, a principal, and teachers around this work. 
And you know, our my contact is, information is on the website. More than happy to answer any questions that may come up. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gregson. I really appreciate you being on the show today. Um, and maybe you know, towards the end of the the school year, we can we can jump back on and kind of see how things are, are moving and changing. Who knows what could happen? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Next six months. <laughs> but thank you so much. It's been a great conversation. Thank you so much for having me. And this is Christy Hool signing off for this episode of The Classroom Matters. And you can see this podcast and all of our other podcasts at the First Person uh, Classroom YouTube page with the Educate.today organization. 